why couldn't GPs just order pharmacogenomic tests much like any other biochemical test? They can and they could, but they don't. Uh, and, and part of the issue is, you know, when you look at the literature, which again was what we've done, the patient concerns are, well, are you going to tell me who my dad is? Are you going to tell me what my life expectancy is? Are you going to tell me what disease I've got coming down the road? And, and they have all these concerns. And you can't just take DNA for someone in the same way you take blood. Although when you're taking blood, you are taking DNA. You're not taking it to analyze the DNA. You're taking it for the reasons. And so, you know, when you've got a patient for you, say, I need to take your DNA. There's all these concerns in their heads that you've got to overcome before you can actually take the DNA. You must, you know, get proper informed consent, not written, but verbal. So the patient knows. Uh, and one of the interesting things is um, to pro patients from deprived areas are very often worried about this information going to the police, for instance. And worried about them being used to solve crimes and then being implicated on a national database. So there's all these things we've got to think about as healthcare professionals so that we can reassure the patient that the bit DNA we're taking are these few little bits here. And all they'll tell us about is their medicines and nothing else. And similarly, that data will be secure. It will not be given to anybody else. We can't tell them anything about parentage. We can't tell them anything about future disease risk or anything else. And it will not be used by anybody else other than the healthcare professional. So that's just to get consent. We've got to get that right. Then when we got the test result, we need to have the time to explain it to them. So it's not just a matter, just like we're, I have my HbA1c done every year. And basically I assume if I hear nothing, everything's okay. And that's kind of the modus operandi of GPs now. If you hear nothing, you're fine. If you hear something, then something's wrong. With your DNA test, if it's negative and there's no change, we still need to tell the patient that. And we still need to talk about those other medicines. But the reason we need to tell the patient, there's evidence it improves patient adherence. If they think the medicine is individualized to them and is safe and appropriate for them, there's increasing evidence they're more likely to take it. I mean, it's not going to resolve the non-adherence problem that we have, but it'll make a good contribution. So if you want to get the most out of the test, you communicate it at the start, you communicate it at the end, and then you make sure that the right changes are made to the therapy and the patient's expectations are managed through the process. And I have to say, you know, our experience is that patients were a little upset when they found it said they were okay, and yet they still had side effects because their expectations hadn't been managed. So all of that takes time and effort, and someone's got to take responsibility for it. And the GPs, that's not a priority. That's not a time. And if they have to do five tests before they get one that's useful, they just won't do five tests. So what they need to be able to do is say, look, when go to your doctor, go to your pharmacist, ask for a test, let them talk to you about it, and they can give me the result and discuss it if need be. If not, they'll just discuss it with you. So it's something ideally we can fit into the new medicine service. This would fit perfectly into there. So it's something we're already used to doing, but just gives us that extra piece of information. Hmm. Mm, I see the point. Now, are there any other people's experiences that we can learn from? Um, for example, are, are there community pharmacies in other countries that are operating pharmacogenomic services? So, so well, obviously, there's the, the Holland experience where it seems to be going well. Um, I don't think all patients are getting it, could get it, but th there is definitely a head of steam in Holland about doctors and pharmacists working together. In Norway, I know full well that it's just led by doctors and basically doesn't happen or didn't happen the last time I was there to any great extent. Uh, I know from the, the, the Australian experience, which was set up as a private service, that the measure of success was that the doctors actually got to the point of saying to the patients, can you go to the pharmacist, get this test first, and then I'll prescribe for you. Now, there is a difference in Australia because patients are used to paying for their care. They don't get it as free as we do in the UK. So therefore, it's more acceptable for the doctor to say that and say, actually, look, I, I, I'm going to need to give you an antidepressant. Sometimes we have to give three before one works. If you go and get this test from the pharmacist, then actually we can get one or far more likely to get the right one for you first time at the right dose. And patients do that. So that, that's kind of reverse engineered and integrated in uh, as a private service. It's not going to happen in the UK because you can't say to a patient, go and pay £50 or £60 to your pharmacist for a test and then we'll work out what drug to give you. Patients expect that to be given for free. But it does show that when the doctors see the benefits and see the results, they, they engage with it more. So once they've sent a few patients or they said to the pharmacist, every time you do an NMS for someone with hypertension or pain or whatever your service is, please do a PGX test and that will be charged to the surgery. And then they get the results back. 
then we suddenly get that relationship working and we see the benefits and the patient gets better quality care.